Thanks for joining us this morning. As I said, my name's Steve. I get to lead this church. We've done that for the last five to six years. It's been an adventure. Never have we had a burst pipe at the end of the road. And never have I come back from not feeling so well. It's been 10 days of not feeling great. I've just functioned. Uh, on Monday, I was in A&E because my whole jaw had seized up. And I had an infection in my teeth. So wh- whenever you get that, that concentrates the mind to uh, praying. Praying quite a lot. So we pray. So we're going into... Everything all right, Jordan? So, it's good. You good, Jordan? You good? Yeah. Oh, okay, great. So we're just pressing into uh, this morning into the Word of God. And um, we're looking at, last week, we looked at the letter of Philippians uh, into um, being risk takers. Looking at Aphrodite and seeing what the being risk takers for the gospel was. And it was a word that's only ever used in the letter of Philippians, which is to be risk takers, to be gamblers, to take risks. And of course, today, in today's world, we aren't on a daily basis being called to risk our lives uh, for like the early church was, or the persecuted church is today across the world. But we spoke about last week, maybe we're called to risk our reputation by asking someone to alpha, or offering to pray for someone, or telling someone about Jesus Christ, introducing to the person that will change their lives. And sometimes it's a risk beginning to pray. It's a risk to go back into prayer when we've been disappointed with unanswered prayer. Or even to come back to church when church has hurt us. That's a risk that maybe God is calling us to do in this time and place. And this morning we're going to unpack over a few minutes the verses from chapter 3 to verses 1 to 11. But first of all, I want to talk about a risk. A risk that we might be starting today. It's not that today will be the end of what we're risking, but maybe God is calling us to risk to dream again. To dream again. A risk to dream. Dream with God once again. Maybe we've stopped dreaming in the storms and the turbulence and the disappointments of life. When we think God has gone silent or given up on our dreams and we've put layers to protect us from going back to our dreams. Maybe dreams beyond the dreams beyond the dreams to something that we first love. Maybe that's what God is calling us slowly and gently to rediscover this morning. To dream is to open up our hearts. To be prepared for disappointment, both disappointing ourselves and sometimes we feel disappointing God. However, the flip side of not dreaming is we never get to risk and have the opportunity to live life to the full by the power of the Holy Spirit living in each of us. I think we're being called as a church to get some seeds that are dreams that maybe have gone but gone and we need to take up again. Maybe they're new seeds, but we need to dream big, pray hard and think long term. We need to dream big. Pray hard and think long term. I think the time is right to begin to offer up our hearts and minds to dream again. I think that's what was happening in the encounter sessions during the week at the church when we gathered. As people are going deeper into their souls, into their hearts. And God is preparing and healing and preparing the soil for some seeds of dreams to come. It might feel too early for those seeds, but I think God's asking us in the last weekend to think about it. You see, as we grow older in lives, studies have found that as youngsters, and many times before for me, as young people, it's our right side of the brain where our loki, our thoughts come from. And the right side of our brain is where our imagination, our creativity, our dreams come from. As we get older, our kind of Loki, our, our centre of our thinking goes over to the left side. And that's far more logical. And so as we get older, we kind of stop dreaming. And we get really practical. Or we get pragmatic. Or dare I say cynical when people talk about dreams. Okay, you can't do that. That's not possible. Just accept what your lot is. We settle for getting by. We lose sight of our first loves and become critical, tired and weary. Yet, the word of God offers us an alternative. 
the word of God offers us an alternative. Because in Joel 2, verse 28, as it comes up, we see how this is the upside down kingdom of God, where the right side and the left side are reversed. And afterwards, the prophet Joel says, I will pour out my spirit on, pe- on all people, not just some, but all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on earth. You see how that is countercultural. The old men, people that should be speaking and thinking out of their left side, are suddenly having dreams out of their right side. And young men are coming up with strategy, thinking about visions and maybe some logic alongside those dreams. But that's how God works. It's upside down. It's countercultural. It catches us by surprise. Yesterday, as a church, we gathered and started to dream. I don't think you've missed anything by not being there. But I wonder if today you start dreaming too. We're going to show a video that the team produced to help us where it's sometimes impossible, but with God, everything is possible. Sometimes you need to get knocked down before you can really figure out what your your fight is and how you need to fight it. Sometimes you need to feel the pain and sting of defeat to activate the real passion and purpose that God predestined inside of you. God says in Jeremiah, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Hear me well on this day. When you at this day when you have reached the hilltop and you are deciding on, on next jobs, next steps, you would rather find purpose if than a it. job or a career. Shoot it. Purpose is an essential element of you. It is the reason you are on the planet at this particular time in history. Your very existence is wrapped up in the things you are here to fulfill. Remember, the struggles along the way are only meant to shape you for your purpose. When God has something for you, it doesn't matter who stands against it. God will move someone that's holding you back away from a door and put someone there who will open it for you. But if you're willing to take the harder way, the more complicated one, the one with more failures at first than successes, the one that has ultimately proven to have help. more meaning, more victory, more help. glory, help. Then you will not regret it. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't know. You know, uh, you'll probably be about as good as I was. That's kind of the way it works, you know, and I, I, I was below average. You know, so, whoa. So you'll probably ultimately rank somewhere around there, you know, so. I really, uh, you'll excel at a lot of things, just not this. I don't want you out here shooting this ball around all day and night, all right? All right. OK? All right, go ahead.
Don't ever let somebody tell you you can't do something. Not even me. All right? All right. You got a dream, you got to protect it. People can't do something themselves. They want to tell you you can't do it. You want something, go get it. Period. We're hardwired for in our souls to dream. Creation was God's dream. You are the apple of God's eye. That apple, in biblical terms, is the pupil. God stared at you and created you in your mother's womb. He created you creatively, with imagination and wonder. With God-filled dreams, anything is possible. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, in the different one will come up, but I'll read... For it's my God's, by God's grace you have been saved. You received it through faith. It was not our plan or our effort. It's God's gift, pure and simple. You didn't earn it. Not one of us did. So don't go about bragging that you've done something amazing. For we are the product of his hand. Heaven's poetry etched on lives. Created in the anointed. Jesus, to accomplish the good works God arranged long ago each one of us are made in the image of God that word uh, heaven's poetry etched on lives means poem in Greek it means that you are a work of art and as works of art we're called to have big dreams and so we are to dream and imagine with and by and through the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives show me the size of your dream and I'll show you the size of your God We have a big God. His all things are possible. So we dare in the turbulence of economic, world, health, strife. We dare to dream again. Joel 2, 28 tells us what we are to dream dreams. The greatest problem in the turbulent world is not the turbulence or the storms of life. It's as we get older, as we go on, we get stuck in the old ways we think, in the old logic, we start to see the purpose of our lives of just arriving safely at heaven's gates. That was never the purpose of our lives. Our purpose of our lives were to live God-sized dreamed lives fueled by the Holy Spirit and all flame. Sometimes we've lived a life that we're playing it safe. The problem is, as scripture tells us, the day we stop dreaming is the day we start dying. Without vision, the people will perish. Proverbs 29, 18. We are called to be radical risk-taking dreamers of Jesus Christ. Jesus at the center. We are called to expand our capability and ability to dream. It's part of our very image that God has called us to be. To dream, to imagine Queen Square all singing for Jesus. For Crawley to be claiming the, uh, the name of Jesus. For our prime ministers and those in power to bend their name at the name of Jesus. To see healings and miracles in the name of Jesus. To see breakthroughs in life in the name of Jesus. To live in that expectant awe and wonder that is natural, or should I say supernatural, by a byproduct of a spirit-filled life. But I think we've become pragmatic, problematic and cynical. The time is coming to dream again. We are called as individuals, as church, and as church in this land to dream dreams that are destined to fail without divine intervention. We are destined to dream dreams that can, will deem to fail without God's help. We're not to get by life and then to plan it so well that we don't actually need God. All we need to have is God-sized dreams for our lives, for our marriages, for our parenting, for our work career, for our church that can only happen by the power of God. Because in our weakness we come and in his power he responds. Dream big, 
pray hard and fast hard and think long. There's daily wins towards a dream. It's in the ordinary daily wins that we move towards it. But it's in our act of surrender we give God the space and the grace at the pace to come alongside and help us. In the upper room in Acts 2, people have got a gathering after the death of Jesus and Jesus has promised the Holy Spirit will come. And we don't have to tarry anymore because the Holy Spirit came and lives in me and you. The very thing that rose Jesus from the dead, the very person that rose Jesus from the dead lives in me and you. But maybe this is a time that we wait patiently, we tarry to see where the Spirit is moving in our lives. It's a gentleness and a kindness and maybe sometimes a revealing that I think the seasons we've seen. Our job is to prepare the table, to set the table, ready for the spirit to move, to be great prayers, to be praying fasting, to see amazing breakthroughs, to be reading scriptures, to gather together and worship like we do on a Sunday, to to prepare our hearts for the Holy Spirit to move. You see, if Bethlehem, the birth of Jesus, was God with us, Calvary and the cross was God with us, for us. Pentecost, Acts 2, is God in us. Each one of us have the power of the Spirit in us. Are we waiting for the pilot light to be turned up? We're filled with the Spirit, but my goodness, I pray for each one of us who are desperate to seek God, see the pilot light of the Spirit and be all flame, all in for him. The answer to every prayer that we will pray today is always and is always more of you, Holy Spirit. That's the answer to all our prayers. I want to be more patient, more Holy Spirit. I want to have joy, more Holy Spirit. I want this person healed, more Holy Spirit. It's the way that God acts in the world. It's through the person, the power of the Holy Spirit. It's where we see renewal, revival, reformation and renaissance in our society. It's not a good sermon. That's not revival. It's not a good service or a series of services. It's not a great worship song. It's not a great prayer meeting. They're all good. But the purpose of a sermon isn't to feed you. It's to make you hungry for Jesus. It's to hungry for that life. To be desperate to dream again when you stop dreaming. To be desperate to press into Jesus when you stop believing. It's to inspire us to keep going on. To dare to dream again. It's the foundations of our very faith. To give hope and to press towards Jesus. To press towards his holiness. And I think in the last few weeks here as a church in this time of prayer and fasting. He's calling us back again and again to the foundations of our faith, to our very identities. Because when we are secure in our identity and know that we're loved, not because of anything we've done, because of what he's done, we dream God-filled dreams. If we do it the other way around, we dream our dreams and ask God to join in with those dreams. When we know our identity and we've soaked in the presence of God, we come up with dreams that are inspired by the Holy Spirit and not ours. We're in this series, and I'm, if you want to hear the whole preach, come to the six, because of, uh, we won't get to finish it today. But we're in a series about seeking joy in all circumstances. It's not getting what you want, this joy, but it's appreciating what you have. Joy isn't the easiest or the obvious choice, but it is a choice. Paul, who writes the letter to the, letter to the Philippians, writes in a prison under persecution. And he writes, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And so this morning, in order to dream again, we need to know what the source of our dreams and our power. And it's a man called Jesus. He is our joy. Each one of us isn't disqualified. Philippians 3 tells us 1 to 11 about our identity it says whatever happens my dear brothers and sisters rejoice in the Lord I never get tired of telling you these things in other words Paul is saying it's really really important in no matter the circumstances of life to always rejoice in the good times and the bad times 
You see, I've learned as a parent, one of the lessons that I learned is that when you're tired of saying something to your children, they finally hear it. It's gone over, over and over again. Marketing says that you need to tell people seven times before they get an idea. But Paul lived in a very less noise-polluted world. And actually, he says it twice that we must rejoice. And so I think it's an important aspect of our dreaming is to be thankful, to be gratitude, and to have joy. I think he's calling us to go deeper in our relationship with him. And that's why I think there's dreams behind dreams. You'll see if you read the rest of the letter of Philippians, because I want to leave some space for God this morning so we won't go, that Paul writes his credentials. If we get Philippians 3, 1 to 11 up, that'd be great. And so we see that he goes, for it is who we are, the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Jesus Christ, who put no confidence in the flesh. He's speaking to people that want anyone who comes to Christianity to get circumcised, because that's what the Jewish people used to do. Praise the Lord, that's not the case anymore. But what he's saying is, anything plus Jesus isn't the gospel. The gospel is Jesus Christ is your loved of who you are. That's your identity. And maybe the time to dream is to know that in your hearts. To dream that you are loved even if you feel unloved. It's to press into that again and again. You see, what the people that Paul was writing to were doing was making it about what you did to be a Christian. It says that religion says it's about D.O., what you do. Christianity is about done. It's what Christ has done for us. D-O-N-E. The gospel can't be earned or deserved. It's a free gift. It's almost like the father saying, here's the deal. You take all of your sin, everything you've ever done wrong, and at 53 years old, there's a lot of that. All the sin, all the things we've done wrong, God says, we're going to transfer that into my account. I'm going to go ahead and just pay that all in full. So he's taken all our sin and paid for it. It's gone. But there's more. And this is where we get to dream. I'm going to take everything Jesus did his righteousness, all the stuff that he did in his ministry of being the son of God, everything perfect in him, I'm going to transfer into your count. And so your account isn't neutral, your account is full. That's the gospel. We're given a full account in Jesus Christ. It's not about calling it even. It's giving life to the full. And it's nothing you can deserve. It's nothing you earn. It's just freely given. That's the gift of grace. I've said many times that the gift of grace is being outpoured this morning. But faith is believing it's for you and accepting it for you. Are you accepting that gift of grace? That you don't have to earn anything from God. You see, Paul goes on a bit longer on about his credentials. He has lots of things that he can put in front and behind his name. Can we have the next slide, please? Uh, keep going. Oh, there we go. So you're right. You're very right. He says, I'm a pure... So he says that in, in the book of Philippians, I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel, a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew. If there was anyone, I was a... Anyone to boast, it's him. I was a member of the Pharisees, demanded strict obedience to the Jewish law. Paul was the most religious person you could imagine. You know, he's saying all this because he was circumcised on the 80s, means he was never not a Jew. He wasn't someone that got converted. He was always a Jew. He says he's a Hebrew of Hebrews because at the time there were other Hebrews that became kind of uh, dirtied in the kind of waters that the Jewish people thought by becoming more Hellenized, more Greeklized. He talks about being in the tribe of Benjamin because there was only two pure tribes Israel thought and that was one of them was the tribe of Benjamin. So Paul was saying that if it was about what he did, he would definitely be okay. 
But when he came to know Jesus, he realized it was nothing that he did was his confidence. It was only in the love of Jesus was his confidence. And so we can rack up sort of skills, awards, job titles, children even, marriage as kind of ways that we make ourselves confident in the world. And Paul says that that is all rubbish. The actual word he uses in Greek means excrement. He says it's absolute rubbish compared to the love of Jesus. And so this morning, as I cut out most of my preach, you'll be pleased to know as we go to a time of ministry. I think we're being called to dream dreams again, to believe the impossible, but from a foundation that is rooted and deep down in our identity in Christ. And what we mean by the identity in Christ is in a world of fear and loneliness, in a place of idols when people go after money and success, that the only place to have our confidence is in Jesus. We know where that gets rocked and there we have to trust God more. Each one of us know where we put our confidence and it's not always in Jesus. When you're a church leader, you put your confidence in the number of people who come to church. When that gets rocked, Liz says to me, trust God. Or Liz, about parenting, well, suddenly I'm a bit more confident in that because I'm, I don't know why. But maybe suddenly it's like, oh no, we need to trust God. So you know where your, your confidence is. What I'm asking for this morning is to open our hearts again, to be filled with the love of Jesus and to start dreaming again. Dreaming and reimagining. Not being cynical, not being problematic, not being pragmatic, but dreaming again. And I truly believe this morning, as I prepared and prayed this week, that there are some dreams behind dreams behind dreams that you once had and they've gone away. I think he's speaking to you all in your different places. It's come and steward that again with me. But know that you're loved. And from that place of love, dream again. I think he's dealing us as a church in a gentle season. A gentle season where we go from winter into spring. But it's actually what's seen underneath. Keep pressing in. Keep lifting your eyes. Come to the six if you want the three to one to eleven to be unpacked more. But I think we've heard some beautiful things this morning. We've done a baptism. We heard from Jacob about his vision for an installation in the garden, but a hope and prayer for this church. It's a bit like last week when Eddie spoke. That was the most powerful moment in the service about opportunity. So let's stand. So the next couple of weeks, me and Liz are going away to retreat. And this is exactly what we're taking away to steward. is to think about the dreams. To go back into our identity in Christ. To know that we're loved no matter what we do. Not as leaders of the church, but just because we're a son and daughter of Christ. To drink from those living, breathing wells of Jesus. To know that God is a God of creation and he wants us to dream. And I think they're small dreams that are just starting to come. But they'll end up a bit like the cloud in the sky. They're going to grow into great dreams. If your dream can be done by yourself, it's a not a God-sized dream. So I think you'll need some, and we will need, the power of the Spirit to move amongst us this morning. So we're going to pray, come Holy Spirit. The answer to all prayers. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Just going to hold. Just as the Spirit moves amongst us. The Holy Spirit's here. Are you?
anything plus Jesus is not the gospel. The gospel is Jesus. So you don't have to do anything. The beauty of yesterday was the cross-generational nature of the day. We had a six-month-old up to an 80-year-old. God is working throughout the whole generation. That's what I love about this church. That God's not done with any of us. And God is empowering our youth and our kids to be leaders of the church now. Come Holy Spirit, come. What's happened to us before is no indicator. The very thing that disqualifies us qualifies us. There is no one here that isn't God and isn't speaking to. Are you listening? don't do this every week but I think someone's been called to Christ today for the first time you know we have to be talking about this man called Jesus and you're going what is that all about but you're actually hungry and want to know more so it's going to lead in prayer that see where God's moving and then we're going to worship we're going to do some ministry time so uh, about daring to dream or just even stepping out into what God could do so I'm just going to pray for the Holy Spirit to come. And if that's you, that you feel that today's the day you'd like to give your life to Christ, or even take the next step, then I just encourage you to pray this prayer in your heart. Heavenly Father, I'm sorry for the wrong things I've done. Thank you that you forgive me. Thank you that the cross gives me life. And Lord, I'd love to follow you all the days of my life. And I declare you as Lord over my life. I might be scared, but you're with me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.